Hi, kitty cats. I am Amethysta Herrick, your hostess for Gender Identity Weekly, a weekly discussion about identity and gender from the contributors and guests of the Purple Paw publication website, Gender Identity Today. This content is brought to you by subscribers of Gender Identity Today. If you're already a subscriber, thank you so much. If you would like to support shows, just like this one, as well as other content by our contributors, please consider subscribing using links you're going to find in the show notes. So today I have an interesting topic to discuss, observations on feminism. I am joined here by Kendra Koch. Hi, Kendra. Hello. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you. I'm so glad to, to get a chance to talk to you again. Because let's see, you and I know each other for know each other first of all through a women's network called Dreamers and Doers, mm -hmm. and there will be a link to this in the show notes, by the way. But I also know you because you have a Substack publication, and you are the founder of Touchy Feely. Mm -hmm. Can you do you mind actually just giving a quick? Because um, Touchy Feely is a very fascinating. Everything you do is very fascinating. Can you give a quick overview yeah. on that? Yeah, I'm happy to. So Touchy Feely is a comprehensive resource for people who identify as being like highly sensitive or neurodivergent. Um, and basically, we curate like all of the best information and products and uh, experts um, to help you just like cope with all of the kind of overwhelming life that gets thrown at us. So our nervous systems are always being bombarded with like news media, pollutants, all these things. And if you're highly sensitive, it's already like tricky to kind of manage. So we're yeah. just out there trying to make that better. And um, yeah, yeah, and I had the pleasure of speaking with you for our podcast, Touchy Subjects. And so, yep. um, yeah, that's where we talk about the, the touchy stuff. So that was really fun. <laughs> right. Do you, and also, I want to mention, because I see, I mean, it's almost daily, I would say, you do a, a quick video on Instagram. It's probably at, at least one a week, probably two or three a week. Yeah. Um, a, around, you know, sometimes neurodivergence and, and you keep going. I'm, you tell me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just something I've been playing with lately. Like, um, I... I think it's part of the being highly sensitive, but I've always felt like kind of the mainstream wellness, spiritual, like lifestyle advice just doesn't always work if you're a super deeply feeling person. Yeah. Like a lot of it is like, you need a routine. You need to like try harder. Like you need to have, you know, and some of those things can be helpful, but they're not really going to get to the root cause of like why sometimes people are really struggling. And for right. me, I've realized a lot of times it's more of just a like a heart problem like I don't feel aligned with something that's why it's not working and so I've been trying to share these little clips of like maybe go going a little bit deeper on all of these concepts that get thrown around all the time as like advice right yeah and I want to is it was it one of your articles or maybe it was a video there was something I saw recently and I want to say it, there was a point you made that simply trying harder, like, isn't enough. You, you don't mm -hmm. like, that's sort of the point about neurodivergence is that there's no, you don't, it's not just trying harder. Um, I, I want to say maybe you brought up a book. It was the, the hunters, uh, in, in a farming world. I wish I could think of what it was called. Did, was that you? Uh, and I, I've definitely talked about like the trying harder thing doesn't work. Okay. Um, I don't know which book you're referencing, but it's very possible. I hear something out there that's okay. like the, part, the neurodivergent brain is like full of information and it just brings stuff up when it feels like it. So, um, right, right. Uh, yeah, but I do, I definitely agree that like the kind of mainstream perception is that folks who are neurodivergent or struggling, even if it's like on a level of being unhoused. Um, that yeah. those people need to try harder and that that's, their problems are caused by like a lack of either personal willpower or a bad mindset or whatever. But I have a much broader, more like systems view. And I think that mm -hmm. I actually feel like it's harder to be struggling. So like if somebody is struggling, it's not for a lack of trying. Like you don't right. see... you. You cannot see like what trying looks like. You don't really know what's going on in someone's internal world. So 
I pers- like I just don't like that uh, viewpoint. <laughs> I don't think it's accurate. No, no. It, it's but it is a great Western society. Mm-hmm. Thing, right, you know, well, you're yeah. neurodivergent, just lift yourself up by your bootstraps. It's just, what do you have, like 18 bootstraps you got to hold on to? Just mm-hmm. use them all, you know. Mm-hmm. That's going to be tough if you don't even have boots. <laughs> so <laughs> it's an excellent point. Yeah. But, but not maybe, maybe not a horrible segue, kind of a horrible segue. Mm-hmm. But um, Western society, you know, I don't, I think it's very good at, at uh, sort of misunderstanding humanity this is my Mm -hmm. viewpoint if anybody out there is saying you're full of it hey that's fine go make your own video um i love using that phrase right (laughs) you see a movie and you go you know i don't think i would have made darth vader luke skywalker's father that's just not a cool thing that's well go write your own space opera okay you know (laughs) Do you remember that bit I was telling you I would just go off on weird tangents and then at some point it'll come back right around? <laughs> just wait. I'll get there. Um, when we talked um, uh, on touchy subjects uh, a couple of weeks ago, we, um, you know, part of the reason we did talk was about identity and about gender. And you made a fascinating comment or one that I find uh, fascinating when when we were talking I don't remember exactly how the topic of feminism came up, but Mm -hmm. I know that that I made the comment, uh, I made a comment about the divine feminine, and then you had, you made a comment about expectations that, that we, that Western society puts on, on women and and modern feminism, I think, you know, falls into this as well, the expectations. So I agree with this. I have not written an article about this and I've been meaning to like last December, I think I was like, oh, I should write this. That would be fascinating. But you gave me a great motivation to to talk about it. Um, so I want to start off by saying, now that we're like six or eight minutes into the video, I am not an expert on feminism. And Kendra, I think mm-hmm. you, you, you would say the same? Yeah, 100%. Like, I haven't studied it in a formal way. I'm definitely not the expert. I just can talk from, like, my personal experience of, like, what I've... Right seen and what I've interpreted and what people have told me it is. But yeah, I'm definitely not the expert. (laughs) Right. So there may be points that are, I don't know if I want to say controversial, but perhaps, you know, Mm -hmm. not what you're going to find in an academic course about feminism. But I would love to have this discussion. First of all, Kendra, I I just, I love talking to you because you're fun. (laughs) Um, And this is a cool topic. So um, do you... I would love to first to talk first of all, just like our, our like how I learned about feminism, and, and same with you. Do you want me to to start on this or? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. It's my show. I'm asking you. How should we do this? It's not really my show. It's a discussion. So um, when I was an undergraduate, and so this was this was you know the 1980s. Oh gosh. Um, I took a, a course, so so I went to UC San Diego, my, the college I went to, and they made you, so I was, put, I was in Muir, Muir College, John John Muir College, and they make you take two courses, Muir, it was like Muir 40 and Muir 50, I think is what it was. The first, They were just writing, com, they were composition courses. Mm-hmm. The point being that, you know, English, sorry, uh, college students can't write. And and now that I, you know, am, am editing like stuff on Medium, now that I'm seeing things coming in, I, I think I can confirm that. You know, it's really there are a lot of people who just cannot you have very, very little mastery of the of the, the English mm-hmm. language. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it's cool, you know, and sometimes, you know, what I love to do is, is continue to talk about it, because for some reason, grammar and vocabulary are hobbies for a chemist. So whatever that meant. But anyway, Muir 40 was great. Muir 50, you had a choice of topics. And so Mm -hmm. I went, oh, existentialism. (laughs) I could use a good pick me up. So why don't I go ahead and take the section that that's about existentialism? 
And and for anybody listening who doesn't know anything about existentialism, it's not a pick me up, okay? It's you know the point is that there's there's no deity, there's no purpose to life. You know, we exist only to die. I think I summed that up all right. Actually, <laughs> I could end with that. That's basically, what I would say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's not a pick me up, but you know, good thing to th- it's just good to think about. You know, what is my mortality? What is my purpose? What is my mortality? Am I mortal? I think that's the better way to think of it. So there was this TA. I wish I could remember her name. She was the, I, I know she was European, possibly French, I think, and had always wore this extremely bright lipstick. I loved her, by the way. She's bright, bright lipstick and this long black hair. And she always had like black turtlenecks before, mm-hmm. you know, Steve Jobs made it cool, right? Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, the point is, we would sit in in her office, and I'm, you know, 19 or something like that. She's 30-some-odd. I don't know. But I was sitting in her office, and she'd give me Sobrani cigarettes. So I'm sitting there with my French cigarette feeling, or English. Sorry, we looked it up. It's British, I think, but whatever. <laughs> sitting there with my purple cigarette, or pink. Perfectly, you know, secure in my femininity. Um, smoking, and we would talk about just like anything. And, and feminism... For anybody who doesn't know, I am transgender, if it hasn't already, like, leapt out of the screen. And so uh, feminism and femininity were, were very, you know, interesting to me. So, point being, we're sitting there talking, and she would she told me about feminism um, as she saw it. It was apparently a European viewpoint. And if there are people in Europe who go, no, that isn't it, um, you know, it's her, okay? But it had to do with the divine feminine, that feminism was not about um, man and woman, but about, or male or female, but about the divine feminine and the divine masculine. And Western society uh, tends to, not even tends to, what Western, ma- uh, Western society very much favors the divine masculine. I have definitions for these we can, we, we, we can get into, but... The divine feminine, because it is it is uh, disfavored, or at least you know certainly, I don't want to use the word dismissed, but I think that's pretty close. This is why women have 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 been sort of relegated to positions that that are considered inferior, regardless of mm-hmm. of their value to society. So, so that was what I learned. Feminism meant was to to elevate the divine feminine. Um, you know, let me put a period there because I talked for like five minutes straight and I don't know. Did I take a breath? I think I might have. <laughs> you must have because you're still sitting. <laughs> <laughs> so, so now that I've gone that far, could, what, what is, what is your, um, what is your, your thought on, 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 uh, feminism? Just fe- for, don't, no need to go into, uh, um, you know, how you feel about modern society. Mm-hmm. How do you see feminism? Um, I mean, I guess it's changed, like, over time, what I viewed feminism as. But I think right now where I'm sitting, I feel like it's a kind of like a social and political movement that has a, probably, like, a positive intent. Like, I think the intention is, is good, but um, the actual, like, meaning or result that's come out of it is maybe where I I don't know how to, like, I don't know how to define it in in that way. Um, I am really glad you brought up like the divine feminine. And I think that that feels more, that feels more like the deeper kind of more true, uh, core of feminism. And it's interesting because I also see that those terms being co-opted by like other movements. Um, right. And so it's, this is just something that I've kind of been playing with in my head and maybe struggling with a little bit. It's like patriarchy, feminism, capitalism, how they were talked about. And like, cause you mentioned also being really interested in like words and language and yes. I am too. And like most of my career, I've been a writer of some kind. And so I'm always thinking about 
I was also like a marketing writer. So in marketing, when you're writing, you're trying to tell a story or persuade. So I'm always thinking of feminism and capitalism and patriarchy, like which I see as linked now, um, mm -hmm. as having its own marketing campaign, right? And now we're like we're like remarketing it with new language and. People are more interested in spirituality and people are thinking, you know, a, a little bit away from like these older, more religious terms, but have the concepts actually changed? Like, that's the question that I think I have. Like, are the core right. concepts the same as they were in the 80s? Or like, is this just an American thing? Is it a European like thing? Is it a Western thing? What happens when you look at femininity in indigenous cultures? Like... So that was a very oh long-winded way to say that I think feminism <laughs> is like a Western definition of like this kind of cultural protocol. Right. Yeah. I, that's, I think that's an excellent point. <laughs> if you look at indigenous, you know, still recent indigenous cultures, yeah, how is, how is, the, how is the feminine considered? Um, mm -hmm. We could go ba back to a lot of, a lot of history, um, which I don't know is, is going to be a great idea. Because I was going to, some of my background is also, um, I like to study magic, the tarot, um, the golden dawn was a big, uh, a big influence on, on some of my early thought, hermetic order of the golden dawn from the late 19th century, I guess. Um, and just in general, hermetic Kabbalah mm -hmm. that, that has, uh, that's been out there for a while. So there are two aspects. The, the way Hermetic Kabbalah, well, let me change that to Western magical tradition, thinks about energies and actions is gendered. But mm -hmm. the, when I say gendered, I, I, you know, from a from a semantic standpoint, that's the mm -hmm. better way to think of it. So, mm -hmm. because a masculine action is something that is activating and directing. In, in symbols throughout history that it, that have been, um, you know, associated with the divine masculine are generally, you know, something like, and I can try to put this on camera, you know, something phallic, something oh, okay, pointing okay, in a okay, direction, okay. which I think is why, you know, it, it ends up being associated with the idea of a, of a, of a male, though everybody has initiating, activating and directing actions, mm -hmm. um, a feminine feminine action and feminine energies are receiving and generally mm. nurturing, growing, and completing. And oftentimes you'll see a symbol that looks like a cup. You know, the the um I won't go into this, but the Arthur myth around the Holy Grail mm -hmm. that that um oh actually I don't have to go into this because I suppose somebody could just go and pick up wasn't there a Dan Brown book? What's the the Da Vinci uh. Code? Is that what? Yeah. Talks, yeah, yeah. talks about I the grail. It, yeah, I think it does. Yeah. It's not bad. I'm not recommending it. There are certainly better treatises on the, on, you know, mm -hmm. Arthur, the Arthur myth and the grail legend. But, but, you know, there, are, there are two, usually in that grail legend, there are two objects. One is a spear. I mean, there are four usually, but mm. um, one is a spear and one is a chalice. You know, mm -hmm. this, sorry, I did two things that look like spears. <laughs> one is a spear, one is a chalice. So in any event, the point being that when when you are doing an act, uh, some sort of action, you need to initiate it, you need to activate it and send it in a direction. Mm -hmm. And that's good. But mm -hmm. then you also need to be able to to nurture it to completion and and ultimately have, you know, some sort of birth. There was something I forgot there is uh, it shows, you know, it shows a like a cup, but like the womb is also a big symbol of the divine feminine because that's where children, you know, mm -hmm. are nurtured and, and then ultimately born. So so it gets related to sexual reproduction, but certainly is not mm -hmm. limited to it because you make masculine actions. You know, I mm -hmm. make masculine actions and we both make feminine actions mm -hmm. um, because that's part of life. Um, if we were to think about modern feminism, mm -hmm. at least in my opinion, a lot of what I see is saying, 
not only can you have a child, you can also like have a career. But mm-hmm. this only applies mm-hmm. to women mm-hmm. as as America Ferreira makes very mm-hmm. clear in the Barbie movie, by the way. But this only is applied to women. Nobody goes, oh, you're a man and you've got kids. Wow. How do you do it? Um, that dichotomy, that that uh, uh, paradox only seems to apply to women, that you can have children and have a career, as if a career is something masculine. But I think that's crap. Why is, a, why is having a career masculine? For that matter, why is having a kid or uh, having children, why is that only feminine? So I think I talked myself out. Do you have, th- do you have thoughts around this? All right, Kendra, I'm glad you're back. Um, we we had a minor uh, network anomaly. It was like a glitch in the matrix, I think is how to put it. Um, I had just I had just given sort of my 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 um, understanding of the divine feminine and and the divine masculine from Western magical tradition, and then had mentioned um, the last thing you said was was uh i had brought up the sort of this dichotomy that women are not allowed to have children and mm-hmm. have a job sorry screwed that up men are men are allowed to have children and a job but women are not that there's mm-hmm. there's a, a weird duality that uh dichotomy that um that exists so your thoughts on that yeah i mean i definitely was raised with that perspective i don't i'm i think more of the culture that I was raised in than my actual parents, but my mom was, you know, like a, a homemaker and my dad worked. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes when we needed extra money, my mom would pick up like ironing jobs or babysit someone's child. But even her, those like jobs that she took were what were considered in my community, like women's work, right? Like it's like sure. ironing is housekeeping childcare. Um, and there was no expectation on me to like get an ex- an education or have a career or anything like that. Um, and most of my friends who were from that community and went to college, if they did, most of them did not. But if they did, it was to meet like a high net worth like male, like to marry. Sure, sure. Um, not to get and, an education. Yeah. And and I don't, man. I. I... How do I say this in a way that doesn't make me look like this ridiculous old, old person? Because because you you've got to be at least twenty years younger than I am. I mean, I I'm stunned to hear you say this. Like, I mean, even even when you were growing up, this was the perception. Because like fifty years ago, fine. Well, no, not yeah. fine. But I I wouldn't say it's it was the entire perception of the like the whole U S I grew up Mm -hmm. in a really small community, like a a pretty isolated mountain town, pre-internet also. Okay. Okay. Um, well, like I, I think we got the internet when I was in maybe eighth grade or something. So yeah. Um, I'm 37 if that's helpful, but, um, for context, but like maybe part of the reason that mindset was there is because of the religious, like, kind of there was a I grew up in like a really fundamentalist kind of Christian community and it was I guess it was like Baptist but I don't know there I I don't I don't know enough about all the different sects of Christianity like I can just say it was like a very strictly religious kind of community and most of my town was that um so I don't know. I think that 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 mindset still exists in some communities today, even Um, if you're in a bigger city, not so much. But like when I went to college, then my perspective started changing because I saw Mm -hmm. like women who were professors. And when I was a kid, you couldn't even be like you couldn't work in the church. You couldn't be a pastor if you were a woman. Sure, sure. And so I was like, okay, there's definitely a different reality out there. And I read a lot when I was a kid and I had like read about characters who were other things than moms um, that were female characters. And then I moved to San Francisco. So I went from like this small Christian community up in the mountains where there was like no access to anything outside of that community to like living in Boulder, Colorado, which is like pretty (laughs) liberal. 
And yes. like, um, then I moved to San Francisco, which is like even more liberal. So I like saw the whole kind of spectrum of like political thinking, like from be- what I was raised in than where I lived. Mm-hmm. Um, and San Francisco's also got this like very because it's like the innovation hub or like it thinks it's the innovation hub, it has a kind of a directed focus on work, right? And so, and I fell into some of that thinking too. And I was like, okay, well, I don't want to just be a a homemaker. Like I'm interested in a lot of things. I wanted to do something else with my life. And so all the women around me were like, I'm starting a company. I'm being a CEO. I'm going to be like the VP of this or like climbing the corporate ladder, you know? And I didn't really do that exactly, but I saw a lot of it. And like in my own weird kind of career path, I worked um, with a lot of founders. And so some of them were male, a couple of them were female, or like, I'm just defining this in like, like men and women as in like the mainstream definitions. Um, Understood. For yeah. The, yeah. Just to give context <laughs> to like the... I don't even know how to talk about it sometimes. I, but, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not in like, yeah. So just to give context to like the thinking that I was in. Um, and I will say that like, I was very confused because I felt like the feminist movement and like allowing women to work and First of all, the, th- the thought that we have to say allowing women to work is weird, right? Like, so first, that's something to me that I think means something. When we're in an environment where we have to have a movement to allow women to do something. It's a great point. <laughs> yeah. And then, <clears throat> okay, so we've gotten that far, I guess. And what I've learned about feminism in all this time is that um, it was to give women rights. Like, that's what Mm -hmm. I was told. Feminism is to give women rights that they didn't have and to allow them to be whatever they want to be. And that sounds awesome. I'm like, okay, yeah, we need that. That's really important. Of course. But then what it did was cut women off from the, like, allowing women to be homemakers and to be mothers. So... We went from you can only be a a mother and a homemaker to you must do everything that men do and you can't do both, but you also have to do both because there's no social structures for childcare or um, like like all of the the housekeeping and everything that homemakers were doing. So what I saw like my generation what happening with my generation is that everybody is getting overstretched, like especially the women, because now we're doing all of the homemaking and we have these like careers and it's too much for one person. It, it would be too much for anybody though. Yeah. I mean, it's too much it's, for a couple. It's too much for a family. Yeah. Like we're not meant to raise families in isolation. And that's something that happened right. with capitalism. Right. Oh, good point. Really good point. Can I actually return to something that that you said too? Um, so let's see. There, so there, there was a point you made about um, while you were growing up. Mm-hmm. So I'm I'm I'm, extra, I'm I'm extemporizing here. You're gonna have to bear with me if I, if it takes me like two minutes to make this whole point. Sorry, but you you made the point about uh, coming from a, a Christian background in particular, so small town uh, Mm -hmm. Christian background, and then moving, you know, ultimately to San Francisco and getting a a completely different perspective. And one of the thoughts that I've had more recently, particularly around the idea of the divine feminine, what I brought up was the Western magical tradition. And Mm -hmm. the Western magical tradition is, is traditionally based on Christianity Mm-hmm. Because if you did magic, you know, in 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 the the medieval era, mm-hmm. um, you you had the, the tendency to be killed. You know, the mm-hmm. church would mm-hmm. come and 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 just kill you. But one of the other big aspects of Christianity, particularly starting around um, really the medieval era, is cutting out 
the idea of the feminine because it used to be Mary was was a big thing and and in in Catholic Catholicism, whew, I'm not a Catholic. Um, there is still an aspect of you know Mother Mary. You know what do they do? There's the Hail Marys. I think is the the um, the thing they say with a rosary. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. Catholics are going to kill me. I'm sorry, so. but um, but most of the feminine has been ejected from Christianity. In fact, there was a there used to be a sect. Oh gosh, I think they were in Argentina, somewhere in South Central or South America. There was a, a sect of Christianity that elevated Mary that was excommunicated. Mm -hmm. The entire sect excommunicated because the Vatican said, no, we do not elevate the feminine. So the point I was going to make, I'm finally getting here, is I wonder, Christianity has colored psychology, philosophy, and science, uh, you know, pretty much since, you know... Christians went and stabbed anybody who didn't want to convert. Mm -hmm. And so my point here is that since, since Christianity has colored much of what fuels Western society today, I wonder if we're seeing the lack of divine feminine because that's just this underlying sort of bedrock of thought that, no, what's good, what's perfect, you know, what saves people is the masculine. It's, it's, mm -hmm. you know, God, who's a guy with a, beard mm -hmm. and you know it's jesus who's a man who who died for you and i'm sorry i don't know the whole christian mm -hmm. <laughs> the whole christian thing so i mean i'm curious if that's that's why we have to have things like you bring up a movement why do you have to have why do we have to fight for the idea that that women are capable it seems so ludicrous mm -hmm. I think I made my point. I hope I made my point. Yeah. Did that point make any sense? <laughs> it does. I'm, I don't know, like, I don't know what's real, but like what, or like what's true, but I, I feel like capitalism has a main, a major hand in it because when you design structures and businesses around maximum profit or profitability, what you do is you you kind of strip away other things that are really important to like humanity and to like our balance with the the earth and all of these things and like you know it, a lot of people and I think I see the earth as like the ultimate symbol of like ba balanced masculinity and femininity like when nature is doing its thing it has like the feminine energy and the masculine energy and it's balanced and it's beautiful and everything is working in symbiosis but to me capitalism kind of breaks them apart and gives them different values so like if what was assigned to be like feminine feminine is like what we traditionally define as like work for women which is like all of the nurturing caretaking and if if all of that stopped, like the masculine money making, like driven work would not be able to continue. Like we, you, like you, my dad could not have gone out and gone to work all day if my mom was not home with uh, me and my three siblings, and if she was not like ironing his shirts and making his meals and like you know we we've kind of devalued work that is highly highly valuable and said like women are going to do it because they're good at it or like mm -hmm. they're the ones that birth the children like they're the ones that carry the babies so they're going to do it and do all of the child um care and everything yeah and one thing i've seen with the feminist movement is like well, men need to start picking up some of the caretaking and the household duties and like the household management and like let women go to work too. And yeah, some of that needs to happen. But I, again, like, I think we should just always look to nature, which is like, I didn't think about uh, some of this so much until I had my own child. But when my daughter was an infant and she was breastfeeding, you know, I got a lot of pressure from work and kind of like the feminist, like the feminist narrative to put her on formula 
And I'm not, I'm not like, this is not like dissing formula at all is life-saving and completely necessary. And some women have to go to work and they have no option to breastfeed. I get that. But I feel like there's a commercial, a commercial um, pressure on women to put their babies on formula and sleep train them and do all these things so that we can get our children on society's system, which is a nine to five work schedule which was designed for men to go to work while women stayed home and cared for kids. Well, now women are going to work and they're caring for their babies. And so we have to like outsource all of this caretaking to companies. And that's where I feel like capitalism kind of fails us. Um, Because like my daughter wouldn't take a bottle. And so she would have starved (laughs) if I didn't breastfeed her. But because I was working during the day, I was a little bit distracted. So she started feeding at night. And then I learned about this thing called night cycling, where babies, in order to feel closeness with their breastfeeding uh, mother, will only feed at night when the mother is, like, (laughs) there and attentive, which you can only also do if you're, like, sleeping with your baby, right? So there's this huge push for women to put their babies in cribs in their own rooms and, like, have them cry all night and not, like, tend to them, um, which is called sleep training. Yes. And when we, when we like don't look at like the deep kind of spiritual and biological need for like human attachment and our babies to be close to us when they're developing and like all these things, we cause harm. And so while it's really great to say women should be able to work and like, I want to work too, but. I don't want it to be at the cost of like my health, my physical health, like your hormonal health and all these things right. are affected right. when you're breastfeeding. Um, or like at my baby's well being. But we have this movement pushing us to do that. So I, I think that we need to have a bigger viewpoint of like what is real feminism. And part of it is like, the right to choose like whoever you are if you're if you want to take on more household tasks great if you want to work it out with your partner great if you don't have a partner okay how are you going to make it happen um Mm -hmm. but not just like assigning roles to people based on their gender or like their societally defined genders and then kind of putting us all in these boxes so that we can all go back to work, you know? And then we have to consume more things. We have to buy more things so that we can make our lives work. Right, right. I mean, you, you bring up a, a, few, a few points, ultimately. You know, the, the biggest one being that, well, consumerism. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we need two people. We need both people in the, in the home working so that we can have, you know, the newest gadgets, mm-hmm. um, which is a great, great point. Um, and I, as you were saying this, what, what occurred to me is that we purposely have gendered these roles. Because, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know, at the very beginning, you said your father was able to go out and work because your mother, you know, stayed at home. Mm-hmm. But there's certainly no reason why, like a family needs, it depends on, obviously it depends on the, the, um, the age of the children. You brought up breastfeeding and that sort of throws a really big monkey wrench into, into a lot of things Mm -hmm. because most fathers are incapable Mm -hmm. of of breastfeeding. Most of them. You know, they could bottle feed their, their child. Like there's ways to make it work and you're right. Every family. You're right. Yeah, but I mean, but, breastfeeding but I, is like the biological way we feed our babies. But there's other ways to feed babies. Very true, and and we, but but we, I don't shoot. Now my now my point is obscured because <laughs> it's like, well, I don't know. Then there's the there's the point that you know you need to be able to if 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 you don't bottle feed. All right, mm-hmm. let me. You know what? I'm going to throw it out. But because we, it's like Western society has purposely did this. We purposely. Mm-hmm think that that men should be the one working Mm -hmm. and and i gotta tell you and i don't you know i'm not i have no names i'm gonna say here 
But I have known some mothers, um, like you let the father take care of the children, you know, like that's, mm-hmm. it's much better for the, for dad to, <laughs> to take mm-hmm. care of the kids. Cause, cause maybe mom's not well equipped for it. I mean, yeah. I'm like, personally, I, it took, you know, my kid turned 12 this year and I'm only now really becoming close to him. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry, Ash. I swear. I wish I were better, but, um, I guess the point is, you know, we, we've purposely cast people into these roles. They're, if you're going to have a family and if you want all the gadgets, mm-hmm. um, you must have somebody who can work and you must have somebody who can who can care for care for children. But if we purposely cast women in the caretaking role and men in this in the the working role, like I, th- I think what what is best is to is to challenge that notion that mm-hmm. feminism implies, um, you know, necessarily switching the roles or or for that matter, as you as you mentioned, really harming the children. You mm-hmm. know, the these children are the ones who are affected by not having parents at home. Um, when I was a kid, I'm trying to I think this was a thing in the '80s. I don't really recall. This idea that you that you got um, like a house key that you wore around uh, yeah, your yeah. neck, mm-hmm. yeah, latch key kids. Do you yeah. remember that? Uh, okay, yeah. So I was a latch key kid. Mm-hmm. I know a few, a few, I know several people who are latch key kids because my parents were divorced. My mother worked. I'm not criticizing anything. Mm-hmm. That being said, uh, you know, could I have turned out better? I mean, actually, I turned out really pretty well. I think, but. Uh, could I have been better? Probably. So I don't know. Now I feel like I've just become mired in this, like this very deep quicksand that says, well, well, the real problem then has always been, um, consumerism and feminism isn't really a, a solution to that. The solution is stop buying so much junk. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, you know? I mean, yeah, I think I think what you're saying about like being a latchkey kid is is a lot of what I was talking about when women are pressured to go back to work. Like in the U.S., there's no like there's really no paid child leave. Like, um, so a lot of women are going back to work if they're lucky. Six week, you know, they have six weeks with their baby before right. they go back to work, and um. The from what I know about attachment, I I have just a, a bachelor's in psychology, but I've read a lot of kind of on child development. I used to work as an early childhood educator, and I just feel like it it can be with a male parent, female parent, if whatever, like any parent, like attachment is really critical. And so when um, when a baby is taken away from a par- like the the primary caretaker, whoever that is. Um, there is a damage that happens. There is a a wound. And, Mm. you know, like you said, could I have turned out better? Well, I mean, I think you, you're an amazing person. You turned out the way you turned out, but the, I, for me, the question, the question is, could, is not, could I have turned out better, but could I have lived with less pain? And I think that's what's happening with, you know, like, yeah, like with all of these wounds that are caused by, you know, capitalism, feminism, whatever, patriarchy, whatever it is, like the systems that we live in that are taking us away from our nature, which is like, yeah, it's natural to be with your babies. It's natural to be in a community and it's natural to have right. help. Like we're not meant to do all these things by ourselves while we're working and like have all these things pulling away from the core survival of just like, not just physical survival. Like that's, I think that's what capitalism does. It like gives us like a physical survival, but it doesn't, Yes. it doesn't give us like the relationships, the community, the family, those things that we need. And it's easy to say, well, we should start, stop buying so much stuff. And I agree with that. Like I, I totally agree with that. But I also think that the way our society is now set up makes that really hard because 
Agreed. Like I w- even like what I was saying with the formula, it's like, okay, even if you're breastfeeding, like you've got to buy a breast pump, you got to buy bottles, you got to buy all these things to wash it, the stuff you need to buy, like a cooler to take your milk to work or to the daycare or whatever. And these things that used to be a little bit more natural and easeful, like have become commercialized. So there's an industry around breastfeeding. There's an industry around formula feeding. There's an industry around like us all living in our individual homes with our individual garages, with our individual cars. We each have a lawnmower and a, you know, whereas like if we lived in more community, we would share these things or we wouldn't need them because we don't need to have like our perfect groomed lawns to like show off to the neighbors or increase our property value or whatever. And like, this is the world we live in. I'm not saying that we need to like, destroy like our societal structures but I think it's good to be aware that we live in a like especially western culture in a society that values individualism and because everything is so commercialized it's hard to put that responsibility on the individual and when we do put the full Mm. responsibility on the individual people are overwhelmed and and feel like failures like that's what I that's what feminism, I think, did to, like, all the, the moms around, like, in my kind of community, like, network who had kids. And they're like, wait a second, I was promised so much from feminism, but now I'm, like, doing laundry and, like, in between meetings and I'm forgetting to eat and I feel like a failure at home. I feel like I'm failing at work. I feel like I'm failing my kids. And so it's just, like, right, right. too much. Yeah. And I guess actually what you just said was what I did. Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. So go ahead. Finish up. No, no, no. I'm, I'm listening. Oh, what you said was what I just did. I said, you know, I, I didn't. It took until my son was 12 before I really started connecting with him. And then I apologized. Mm-hmm. Right. I feel like a failure. I do all the time. I'm like, gosh, I wish I could have been a better parent, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, wow. Uh like, I don't know where to continue here because it's, yeah. you're right. It's almost like not, I certainly don't blame feminism. I certainly have looked at feminism and thought, is this, is this recommending the right things? And really, I think what, what you and I are coming to is the right thing is to, to establish a community, you know, mm-hmm. not to think that, um, not to think that life is how big your bank account is, but to, to think that life should be to not only to, to help your children grow up, but so that you can grow up. You you brought up, yeah. maybe I could have lived with less pain. And what a, the reason why I went, oh, is because that's the way we think of our lives. Mm-hmm. How can I minimize pain? Mm-hmm not maximize our fulfillment. How can I, mm-hmm. how can I live with as little pain as I can? And and that's, I think that's kind of depressing. <laughs> yeah, it is. You're right. You're right. We should think of it more as how can we, but the reason I said that was because like when you're being raised by like adult, at least for, for me, like I, I view my role as a parent to like, Maybe on a spiritual level, my deci- my daughter decided to be here, but like, I'm the one that decided to have her and bring her into the world. So I feel like she's not yes. like a burden and her responsibility is to do what children should do, which is like play, learn, push boundaries, like, and my job is to give her appropriate boundaries, help her learn and give her opportunities to play. Right. I- But I do feel like a lot of society and even some of feminism and some like kind of views children as a burden. And so that's what I meant by like, if your parents had better support, your mom didn't have to work all the time. Right. She could have been there for you. She would have had more resources to do to give you the things that you needed that maybe you didn't get, and you could have had a less painful upbringing mm-hmm. wherever there yeah. were pains for her not being home, you know, like being a latchkey kid. And yeah, and that's what I always have to come back for myself, which is like, 
it's so easy to feel like a failure and be like, uh, I could have all this potential, but you have to just, for me at least, is like have that self-compassion, which is like, I do really think that most people are doing the best they can given the tools and resources they have. And yeah, we can sure. find more tools, more resources and everything and, and thrive. I, I wouldn't even be working on touchy feely if I didn't believe that there were like ways to get out of some of the things where you're stuck in. But, yeah. um, it's hard to be self-compassionate when you put the full responsibility on yourself and don't look at like the kind of macro systems that affect us in environment. That's I don't know if that point. made sense. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, that, that was a great, I think that was a, gr a great summary. <laughs> Yeah, because I'm, you know, I guess I was, I got to the point where I was thinking, well, yeah, it is society. And, and what you're saying is the point is not that it's the society's fault or the individual's fault. Mm -hmm. The point is that, you know, don't blame yourself if, if uh, I'm saying that badly, you said it much better. So I, I think that's very well put and very well, certainly well received on my end. So it's like, the, I don't, I don't, the difference between blame and responsibility like I fully believe in individual sure. responsibility like whatever crap or good or whatever you're handed in life it, that is now your responsibility to deal with and make the best out of but blame right. it's like not your fault that you were like a latchkey kid you know it's not my fault I was raised in this crazy like religious context but that was the realities that we were handed and now like I believe it's my responsibility to do what I have to do with that. Like, even if it's yeah, go to therapy, yeah. every what, whatever it is. Um, yeah. Yeah. But that, that's kind of why I say like, we need this um, perspective of the environments because we, we are affected by our environment and it's so easy to be like, I failed at this. I feel that I'm not doing this. I need to recycle yes. more. I need to, like try hard. I need to get a better job. I need to like spend more time with my kid. And then like all of the to do start eating each other. And you're like, there's yeah, no right, way to win here. Right. Yeah. Then that's do you, when it gets tough. And, do you, yeah. and, and along those lines, one of the things that I've noticed that I do now is I'll pick up my phone at night or something. I'll pick up my mm -hmm. phone and I'll be like, oh my gosh, everybody has so many stories on Instagram. Let me see what I got. I got to watch all of Kendra's videos. Oh. <laughs> But right, we put these, we put pressure upon pressure upon pressure mm -hmm. upon pressure, and sooner or later, like, how do you get out from under all of that? And and uh, yeah. ultimately, that I mean, what a great point. That is really the underlying issue. And I don't know that feminism, or for that matter, chauvinism. I don't know if anybody still mm -hmm. would push that these days. But mm -hmm. um, I don't know that either ends up being a solution. Be, because, I mean, if I were to, to try to bring this together, the the point should be completion, mm -hmm. not not should we activate and direct more or should we nurture more, but mm -hmm. rather can we just finish what we started? You know, mm -hmm. that's yeah. the bigger point. Hopefully that hopefully that that was a, a decent uh, summary of that. But because because ultimately that's what Western magical tradition. I don't want to use the word teaches, but that that's sort of the point with gendered actions is that you you need both masculine and feminine. You can't mm -hmm. really have one without the other, because if you start a million things, pretty soon you just run out of energy. But if yeah. if you just have a lot of a lot of ability to complete, but nothing to to complete, you know, you're just going to be sitting, you know, uh, in languishing. So so both are both are necessary. And and I ultimately I guess it's the completion it's the the completion of the cycle not uh, mm. of the circle, not necessarily you know one or one or the other, pushing women to be to do more, pushing men to 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 do more. But <laughs> let's complete things. Um, yeah, I don't know if that <laughs> was any yeah. good. Yeah, that. That, yeah, the completion. I, I love how you put that in with feminism. I never thought of that before as like a kind of an element of feminism or the divine feminine, like this completion part. 
Um, and I find it interesting how like in society we put them on, again, it's like on the individual, you're either a feminine or a masculine person, but like we need those yeah. within ourselves. Like otherwise we're so out of balance, like individually. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> And yeah, so, and now so I'm pushing about... either. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, no, no. I was just saying, now I'm thinking like back to neurodivergence, but like ADHD is in that bucket. And I, and like that's something I've been diagnosed with. And it part of it is this like constant energy of doing. And like the completion is the heart right. is the part that's tricky. And I'm like, interesting. Like, I wonder if there's like uh, some like feminine energy imbalance that's like part of that or. I don't know. Maybe it's a I'll great thought. That up next. Yeah. Yes. It's a great mm -hmm. thought. And, and this, and I guess that's why I wanted to, <clears throat> why I wanted to bring up originally, you know, how, how Christianity is really a foundation of our philosophy or science, whatever else I said, mm -hmm. you know, philosophy and science is enough. Um, and having that exclude the divine feminine on purpose. Like, mm -hmm. I wonder if there's, we, like we, brought this upon ourselves, you know, to, because we favor the masculine, we favor yeah. the, the doing, go and do and go and do, you know, it's, it's no good if you just sit and complete, but it's like, well, but then why do we start anything? You know, what's the point? So. Yeah. Yeah. It must, I mean, it has to be as like a power thing, right? Like we only exclude Yes. You only suppress and exclude things that you're afraid of, right? Like, so you can control them. <laughs> right. That that was more of a rhetorical question than anything. Yes, I think we both know very well why you suppress <laughs> the divine feminine, because you had a whole, there was a whole point you made about, you know, going and buying and, and, and uh, you know, it's, we end up, capitalism does thrive. Let me rephrase this too. Because I'm, I'm going to end up expressing yet another unpopular opinion, be, because I think a, a social system, or like an economic system, is is somewhat blameless. The implementation, on the other hand, mm -hmm. if you do it poorly, you know. So mm -hmm. our our version of Western society, or I should, let me just say Western society, certainly favors, you know, ultimately all of us being just overtasked and yeah. uh so so we i mean it makes total sense we have a patriarchy because we need to get rid of the idea of completion community nurturing we need to get rid mm -hmm. of it because if we don't you're not going to go and buy new stuff mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. so so anybody out there who's a gender studies person going you guys know need to learn something about you know why a patriarchy exists it's like no, I think we got it. I mean, you know, the purpose is that we buy more stuff, but it's it's depressing. Yeah. I don't, and so I guess you know, trying to yeah. inject, uh, not falsely, but trying to inject, trying to inject a sex where a gender is required, um, mm -hmm. doesn't address it. Let me mm -hmm. let me explain I that because yeah. I real <laughs> okay. <laughs> You know, but I want to hear your we, explanation too. <laughs> okay, because I was going to say, because I mean, there was there was something I brought it up briefly when we were talking before. <laughs> I think that that people go, well, this it is empowering the feminine to, like, I'm going to put it like put a collar on a man and stick him on a leash and put you know get, wear a short skirt and and you know drag the guy along and you can laugh at at the man, like that doesn't empower the feminine. What that does is is elevate masculine actions mm -hmm. like domination and mm -hmm. and uh humiliation and res uh restraint but you've stuck a woman in a short skirt sorry somebody who appears to be a woman in a short skirt and you go well see that's right that's feminine that's cool mm -hmm. she's mm -hmm. pretty hot <laughs> you know mm -hmm. so must must be cool and i guess that's what i'm saying we're we're trying to put a, a sex into into a role when really what we need is a gender. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there was a point that I've made several times because that, that uh, not today yet, but like a good CEO needs to know when to 
push a company forward, when to say, okay, we need to make something, we need to start something. But really one of the, the places where at the very least the CEOs I've seen in startups tend to fail is, is the, okay, now hold back, you know, yeah. pull your foot off the accelerator and let us finish what we're doing here so mm -hmm. that we ultimately end up with something sustainable. Um, if I could bring up a, a, I'm also pagan here. So the earth is a big thing. Mm -hmm. And if you look at seasons, you cannot have summer all the time because mm -hmm. no. sooner or later seeds yeah. die. You mm -hmm. run out of nutrients in the ground. Mm -hmm. Um, seeds can't grow without the earth. The earth can't grow anything without the seeds, but there needs to be the ability to grow something to cut it down and to eat it so that as well, you don't have to eat it, but you know, it, it ends up dying and decomposing over the winter so that you can start over again in the spring. Yeah. And it is a never ending circle. We watch this year after year and none of us sees this, mm -hmm. that if we don't take care of the earth, then we have no food. And this is an allegory for human existence as well. You don't care for yourself. You burn out. I think I'm a great example of this, and I'm not trying to... <laughs> this is not me laying blame on anybody because I've written article after article about, wow, I push myself too hard, and then I fall. Mm -hmm. oh. That's what I do. Yeah. Summer yeah. all the time. I'm in the same <laughs> mode, <laughs> but I'm trying to unlearn it. But that's <laughs> I think that is like... That is kind of the the mode we've been taught like because yes. we we're, we get rewards when we go to school for attendance right like <laughs> right. It, it, even at my daughter's pediatrician okay this is so crazy to me like if you if you cancel a sick visit which you can only make within a 24-hour window you get a $50 cancellation fee but so when last time I called and I was like, I'm not paying this fee because I'm not bringing my kid in for an appointment she doesn't need. You need to like have the space for a kid who does need it. And like, I don't want her to have unnecessary medical care. Right. And yes. they're like, well, if you don't want to pay it, you should just bring her in. And I'm like, so like, what are we what are we <laughs> like? What are we saying there? We're saying you should have unnecessary medical care. Spend half yes. your day coming to an appointment. And take right. the space from a kid who might need it because we want to take your money and we're holding this space so we can collect your money. Like that's literally what right. they're saying. And I'm yes. like, okay, if we're like rewarding kids for showing up at school, not for what they're learning, not for teaching themselves to rest when they need rest, even the pediatrician is doing that. Like imagine how how many of these messages we get like and we have gotten also from our parents right. from our friends from the media about like always being on and then now we're like having maybe after covid where we had like collective trauma like people are starting to step back a little bit and we had a little space from that kind of non-stop going yeah but it's going to take some unlearning because it's like a habit that's ingrained in us like yes. at a deep level at least for me like it is a habit I have to be I feel like so right. anxious when I'm resting which is not healthy or normal like I know that's a sign that it's like I've gone too far yeah right but we but I mean I do the same you mm -hmm. know I'm like oh I really don't want to sit down and, and journal because if I sit down and journal I'm not doing something useful and right. that's the phrase. That's not useful because I'm getting paid for it. Exactly. Writing in my journal, right? And and that's that's a danger sign. So yeah, yeah. I, and now this like this could turn into like a wellness class, you know. But, but what we should do, from, yeah, that's what's missing, right? Like the wellness. Piece, yes, we're like we're like physical bodies. We need that. Yeah. Yes. And so, and so, what I'm, what I'm gonna do then? Because I think we've been, I think we we've been talking a long time. I think we should just direct everybody to um, the Touchy Feely store, right? Sure. Yeah, I have some articles there too. And, and there you yeah. go. <laughs> right. No, I yeah. know. There's a ton of stuff, ton of resources. So, um, 
Kendra, do you want to, I've got links in the show notes, but do you, do you want to, to give a quick, you know, where people can find you? Yeah. Um, touchy feely is just at get touchy feely.com. Um, and if you find me on social media, I'm the only social media account that's going to tell you to get off social media. Um, <laughs> so you don't have to find me there. Like most of the time I'm going to interrupt your feed and tell you to go to something else. Um, but if you want to, yeah, there's some mental health resources and things too on, on the website. So yeah, you can find it. Okay. <laughs> Links to all the, uh, all the social media that you shouldn't click on. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. I know okay. I have to use it to grow my business, but as a person, I would just say, save your life and don't be on social unless you have to. <laughs> right. Right. So, so I realize ne- neither of us is an expert and, and neither of us apparently solved any problems. I know I didn't. I, I think I ended up at, I, now I've got more questions, I think, than I did at the beginning. Same. Um, but, but you, you know, I, I, this conversation was great. I'm so glad to, to have had it. Cause you know, the, the perspective there, especially, you know, to have come from, you know, you, you wanted to breastfeed and everything, you know, and I'm, I'm not going to like recount the entire, um, discussion here only to say that, that thank you so much. I, this, this exceeded all expectations I had around this. Cause I don't even think we really talked about feminism <laughs> in the grand scheme of things. That's what happens when you ask a non-expert to talk on a subject. I'll just give you my feelings about it. Which is Maybe that was the like, point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. And that's why I liked it so much. So, Same. so Kendra, thank you um, so much for, for um, you know, coming and coming and talk about talking about stuff that, that, uh, that we know nothing about. So. <laughs> thank thank you. you so much. Yeah.